material that I was talking about, talking about uh, green or sustainable architecture. We were just getting around to talking about or looking at waste um, in the construction process. Right? Some of you are architects and designers. Your, your work, your action will influence the, the degree of uh, greenness or sustainability in the structures that you design. You know, through your choice of design strategies, your specification of materials, um, and as we see the the size and nature of what you design, but certainly those on the uh, construction end of things, the the contractors and project managers and and tradespeople who actually realize your design have a role to play as well. Remember, our goal of of the goal of sustainable architecture is to reduce the resource use of buildings, so resource use in their construction, um, in their operation and maintenance, um, their energy use, and ultimately their, their disposal or repurposing. So we're going to try to look at all those aspects of, of green buildings. So again, uh, this, is, this certainly doesn't describe everything that we do in this country, but in terms of how we use resources, but it certainly is representative of a lot of our thinking, right? We have, um, generally speaking, a linear once through model of how we use resources. We dig them out of the ground, we take them, we do something with those resources we make, you know, we produce a product, it gets distributed, it gets used, and at the end of the life, that product gets disposed of, right? It's a, uh, good evening, George, we're just getting started here. Right, that's a linear once through model. Um, and as you see in my slide here, there are some flaws in, in this model, right? The first flaw, the two of them are, are fairly obvious, right? The first flaw is that, uh, is that the Earth's resources are not infinite, right? There's not an infinite supply of all the things that we wanna dig out of the ground. And uh, more importantly, the Earth's ability to accept uh, our wastes are not infinite either. And the most, the easiest example of that is, is the Earth's ability to accept the carbon dioxide waste that we produced in the, in the use of fossil fuels, right? Our, our, the Earth's ability to accept that is certainly being challenged. So we need to think differently, right? And, and as architects and construction professionals, we can play a role in that as well. So one thing to think about, obviously, is in a um, in a construction process project, we more often than not have C and D or construction and demolition waste. Right? You see, if if someone on your street is doing a a home renovation project, you'll see a big dumpster parked outside their their house and all the all the stuff that's being demolished and all the waste from the project will all go into there and and uh, hopefully the the neighbors don't also throw stuff in there in the dark of night right that's not what they're supposed to do but so what is c and d waste c and d waste is non-hazardous non-contaminated solid waste resulting from the construction remodeling repair or demolition projects and all sorts of things we can think about uh, brick concrete masonry units wood scrap metal, uh, plaster, wallboard, plumbing, plumbing fixtures, insulation. It says non-asbestos insulation, right? Asbestos insulation would be a hazardous waste and that would be disposed of differently. Uh, roof shingles, asphalt pavement, glass, plastic, landscape waste, right? All those things are produced during a construction project and a lot of them end up in the dumpster and uh, they get hauled off to landfill. Uh, good evening, uh, Nicole, and uh, I think Alan, I just saw you join. We're just getting going here. We're finishing up talking about uh, green or sustainable architecture. Right, so where does that, where does that dumpster go? Right, usually when you're, you know, it's kind of out of, out of sight, out of mind, the truck comes and, and grabs that dumpster and drives away with it, right? And 
from your perspective as the as a homeowner who just is doing the renovation project or the general contractor, right? That that uh, that waste has vaporized, right? It's disappeared. Well, it hasn't really disappeared, right? It's gotten it's essentially gets driven off and for the most part dumped into a hole in the ground. So it didn't it didn't disappear. It just got put someplace else. So what are some of the impacts of that C and D construction and demolition waste? Right? Well, there's a cost to the project or to the owner or the contractor, right? The tipping fee, right? The cost to haul that waste away. Obviously it produces truck traffic and uh, we get the CO2, the carbon impact of that truck, the pollution of that truck driving to the landfills. Obviously it takes land for us to set aside as landfills, right? Land that, that can't go to any other use because now it's, it's being used as a repository of waste. We have methane emissions from landfill, all that waste that's stuck in the ground decays over time and produces methane, right? Methane is a potent GHG or greenhouse gas. And we have embodied energy and we have resources in those building, building materials that are being discarded, right? Resources that are being essentially stuck, you know, placed in a hole in the ground, right? What is embodied energy? Embodied energy is the energy that it took to extract or process to manufacture and deliver that, that building material to the building site. And if we tear it out and, and throw it away, we're wasting that energy that was embodied in that material. And obviously the energy that it takes to produce those materials produces carbon dioxide. That's a greenhouse gas, right? So we're, we're, we're trying to reduce greenhouse gases. So one of the contributions that we in the construction business can make is to not, not create as much waste, not, not, uh, not have as much embodied energy in our buildings that's wasted. What are some of the things that we can do to reduce construction and demolition waste? Well, we can really, we can try to reduce that waste by, by thinking about, do we really need to demolish this, right? Has this building, has this structure really reached the end of its useful life? Right. I know, um, as a homeowner, you're, you're going to say, yeah, you know, I really, I really want to fix up my kitchen. It looks pretty ugly. I, I need to refresh it or, or I need a, I need an addition on the back of my house or whatever. Right. Uh, but you know, you need to think about that. You know, can the lifetime of this building be extended, you know, instead of tearing it down, is there something we can do to, to extend its lifetime? Can we, use this structure for another purpose. I remember we had a slide about adaptive reuse uh, in Tuesday's discussion. Can we reuse some of the materials that are gonna be produced during the demolition? Can we salvage those materials and use them someplace else? So instead of you know, attacking the project with, with chainsaws and crowbars, can we be a little more careful and thoughtful about how we take stuff apart um, you know, that process is called the deconstruction, right? If you carefully take something apart, perhaps some of those materials can be, can be reused. And obviously we have the ability to recycle some of those waste materials, right? But we have to separate them during the demolition process. They can't all go into the same dumpster. You know, we have to separate the wood from the from the gypsum, uh, from the drywall, et cetera, et cetera. In some, in some cases, there are markets for some of those products. What else can we do? Right, we, we saw this again on the slides on Tuesday. We can think about where we are going to build. You know, we want to, if possible, select our site in an already developed area. So we're maximizing the use of existing infrastructure and preventing the need to build new infrastructure, right? We don't, you know, if we're, if we're building out on the edge of the metropolitan area, out in an outer ring suburb, right? Then we're, we're, if we select a site there, then we're driving the need to, to build new roads, to widen roads, to have 
water systems and sewers and electrical lines and everything to go out and serve that construction that we're doing out at the edge of the of the uh, of the fringe of, of Chicagoland as opposed to looking for a site that's that's close in or closer in in an area where the infrastructure already exists. What else can we do to impact waste? Um, here's where the architect or the designer comes into play. Right? We can design smaller, we can design more space efficient structures. Right? You know, I know, I know there's a lot of incentive in all the players in this business to to do things bigger and grander, right? We're Americans. We want we want big houses and big buildings and big cars, but you know maybe that's not the thing that we can really afford from an environmental standpoint any longer. You know, unfortunately, there's a lot of incentives, right? The architect wants a wants a wants a larger fee. The the contractor or the developer wants to, wants to make more money. The banker wants to loan more money. So, you know, there's a lot of a lot of uh, incentives towards doing things bigger rather than smaller, but we certainly want to strive for smaller structures and maybe spend our time and effort on quality rather than quantity, right? Build a, a smaller, higher quality house rather than a larger, lower quality house. Um, we can design using efficient framing techniques and engineered lumber products. Right? We'll see a, a video here in a couple of minutes about um, advanced framing, right? ways of, of framing the, the structure that use less lumber. Uh, certainly we've, we've learned that engineered lumber products quite often can provide the same structural characteristics and do so using less lumber than a, than a uh, piece of dimensional lumber, although they, they do have some, some potential drawbacks and things that we need to pay attention to. Um, we can certainly design around standard material sizes, so we reduce cutoff waste, right? We, we uh, try to design around a module, you know, a four by eight module, whatever the sheet goods or, you know, whatever, whatever sizes of materials we're gonna use, right? So we're not, having to cut and waste as many small pieces of things. We can design for a long service life. Again, instead of um, designing for big size, let's design, instead of quantity, let's try to design for quality. Let's design for a long service life. Let's use high quality, long lasting materials. So the house or building that we design and construct lasts a long time. We can, uh, again, we saw some of these on, on slides on Tuesday, design using re reused or salvaged materials. Again, those are things that, that uh, the architect can specify. We can specify materials with a high recycled content. We can specify locally sourced materials, right? So we don't have to, we don't have, have to truck, have the, uh, have the plumbing fixtures come in a truck all the way from, from Texas or California. Maybe we can find a source of those materials close by. Uh, we also want to um, specify non-toxic or low VOC materials. VOC is volatile organic compounds, right? So we want to get those, those harmful things, those toxic things. We don't want them in our, in our structures. Um, good evening, uh, Christopher. I think you just joined. So uh, we're uh, in the middle of uh, learning about uh, Waste reduction strategies. Good evening, Professor. Again, what else can we do in, in the field? Right, uh, some some things that the architect can do, some things that the the construction professionals, the the contractors, and the tradesmen can do, uh, or some things where where the, the 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 two sides can come together. We can certainly provide some material takeoffs on the construction documents to minimize the contractor's tendency to overbuy, right? The, the contractor's natural tendency, if they need six of something, is to buy eight just so they don't run short. Um, we can arrange, or the contractor can arrange for more just-in-time deliveries to reduce the amount of materials that are stored on site. 
so those materials don't get spoiled or, or stolen, right? We can make sure we protect those materials so they're not damaged from water or weather. Uh, we can potentially save excess or cut materials for use on future projects, although, you know, short two foot pieces of two by four, or two by six don't necessarily help it out, but um, certainly that's a possibility. And we can, to the extent that our suppliers will take it back, we can re return unused materials to our suppliers. Um, so let me play a video here, if you hold on. This is about, uh, what the uh, designers can do. For 30 by 40 design workshop. Today I'm going to be talking about the future of smart design, reusing, reducing, and recycling in home construction. I'm always shocked at the amount of waste I see when visiting a typical project under construction. We all tend to accept that construction is a messy process, but stop to think for a moment about the message that a cluttered and wasteful job site sends to our clients. It would appear that we're sending a significant part of their hard fought for project budget to the landfill, or worse yet, that the project could have cost less than it did. The Construction and De Demolition Recycling Association estimates that construction and demolition waste accounts for 325 million tons of waste each year in the United States, about half of which can be directly attributed to residential construction. The U.S. Green Building Council estimates that building construction accounts for a full 40% of materials used and 30% of the total waste stream in the United States. Fortunately, there are many opportunities for us as architects and designers to reduce these staggering numbers. And they capitalize on our talents as designers, appeal to our inherent need for organization, help our clients save money, and are more resource efficient and enhance energy performance in the long term. What's not to like? So most of us are familiar by now with the reduce, reuse, and recycle mantra, the basic tenets of which apply here as we seek to minimize the construction and demolition waste. But there are also ways that we architects and designers can positively affect the waste stream through design and material specification decisions. Design is by far one of the most powerful tools at our disposal. We can specify renewable materials or products with high recycled content or low embodied energy, and ones that have minimal environmental impact. Or we can choose to reuse existing materials by salvaging a building instead of demolishing it. This is a good place to start. Reuse or repurpose. Not surprisingly, this is by far the most efficient way to reduce construction waste. Repurposing or reusing existing space is a huge resource savings and preferable to recycling, which actually requires additional energy inputs. It minimizes or even eliminates the need for on-site demolition, preparation, and foundation work. And it's an entire building's worth of materials that isn't going to the landfill. Reuse also extends to reclaimed building materials from other projects. Even if an existing structure can't be repurposed or renovated, it's still possible to salvage its non-hazardous materials for re reuse elsewhere. Demolition versus deconstruction. If reuse isn't possible and demolition is required, it's important to divert as much of this waste stream as possible because demolition waste is volumetrically much greater than construction waste. When a project calls for demolition, consider employing a contractor who specializes in deconstruction, which separates materials and assemblies into recoverable components for recycling or reuse. Many will even provide an accounting of the value of the deconstructed materials to use as a tax deduction. This can help offset the higher cost to your client of the more labor-intensive deconstruction process. Reduce the size. There are many cases where it's not possible to reuse an existing structure, and in these cases, the first priority should be to reduce the new building size to an absolute minimum. Here's where your skills as a designer can have the greatest impact. Every square foot we can remove in the pre-design phases represents a substantial savings in material, material that the client will need to purchase, the materials suppliers won't need to transport to the site, and the contractor won't have to install and then handle the inevitable residual waste stream. This is so critical to reducing construction waste that it's hard to overstate. Make your designs as small and efficient as possible. Hey everyone, welcome to Forward. We that. are a new kind of doctor's office that's doing primary care differently. Our best planning. Design also offers the opportunity to thoughtfully allocate the resources at hand. Spaces that serve multiple functions can help reduce the overall material load and space required to comfortably live. 
Carefully designed built-ins, convertible storage solutions, and purposeful space planning all contribute to making this possible. Designers and architects are experts at this. Prefabrication. Manufactured housing and processes of prefabrication result in verifiably lower waste streams. Using materials efficiently and carefully planning the construction process is incentivized in the factory environment, where waste directly reduces profit margins. Factories also effectively manage the supply chain for product delivery, and installation efficiencies are captured in the conditioned working environment as well. Modularity. Design must also seek to efficiently utilize existing material modules. It won't be possible to do this throughout every interior space, but if you focus on the overall structural dimensions and correlate those to a 24 inch module, it will maximize framing efficiencies and minimize material cutoff waste. Besides, designers like grids and modules anyhow, right? This should appeal to your sensibilities. Engineered products. Some products such as the LVL or laminated veneer lumber seen here are specifically engineered for carrying heavy loads. LVL with dimensions similar to regular framing lumber is roughly four times stronger. This results in a material savings using less wood to accomplish the same structural outcome. As an added advantage, LVL is also more dimensionally stable. Using products for their inherent efficiencies ensures we're not using more than we need, effectively designing waste out of the process. Advanced framing. Many of us are guilty of relying on standard practice, the way we've always done it. But framing lumber represents such a large portion of the wing from buildings, it makes sense to rethink common practice. By using advanced framing techniques, we can substantially reduce the materials required for a residential building project. Mm -hmm. Using two stud corners, insulated headers and header hangers in lieu of jack studs, eliminating cripples, using single instead of double top plates, and other techniques can add up to significant material and cost savings. In addition to this helpful diagram, Build It Green offers an excellent common sense guide to advanced framing techniques. Every piece of lumber we can eliminate from the structure is another material that the contractor doesn't have to transport to the site and install, and then handle residual waste from it. The National Association of Home Builders has estimated the potential for savings for a typical 2,000 square foot home using advanced framing techniques as approximately $2,400 in framing material alone. Recycle via material selection. This is another area where we can exercise a lot of control in the design and construction process. We can be cognizant of the materials we specify that contain high amounts of embodied energy, like concrete, whose cement component accounts for roughly 5% of global carbon dioxide emissions. If possible, specify building products with a high recycled content rather than virgin material. Site materials, insulation, concrete aggregate, countertops, carpeting, glass tiles, lumber, and even drywall can all be sourced with high recycled content. Specifying local materials can also reduce waste by minimizing transportation and fuel consumption. Recycle via the construction site. Our project manual and specifications are a chance for us to affect many other parts of the construction process beyond basic material selections. We can use them to detail waste management plans too. Waste management plans set expectations for diverting waste streams, recycling packing materials, stockpiling cutoff lumber for reuse, segregating waste streams, and generally reducing the overall volume of trash that a project generates. They lay out an approach to materials handling on the job site where the waste is generated. The National Institute for Building Sciences has some excellent resource material available describing waste management specifications. Not only did this kind of waste management make good environmental sense, but depending on where you practice, you may even be required to recycle and divert a certain percentage of the project's waste stream by law. And the last thing is education. Reducing the waste stream on a construction site means overcoming ingrained mindsets and embracing an educational component during the construction process. Fostering a team approach where all parties are invested in this new way of working is critical. It helps that beyond the environmental and efficiency offsets, there are cost savings involved in being less wasteful too. And with tipping fees ranging from $10 to $40 per ton, those savings can add up quickly. The education process starts with a commitment on the part of the client, architect, designer, and contractor, and must follow through to each and every subcontractor involved for it to be successful. And a waste management plan can be the linchpin that makes this shift possible. Sorry about that. I always have to uh, work my way around the ads that are in YouTube. Uh, so uh, um, hopefully that was. Uh, beneficial for you. Um, I'm pretty sure that I posted uh, 
a Word doc with all these links. I will double check. But um, again, especially if, um, well, actually all of us can, can bear to go back and watch that again, because there's good ideas for, for all of us, whether we're, you know, architects or, or general contractors or tradespeople, right? There's things to learn from all that stuff. Um, okay. And going back to the tail end of a slide deck is very painful in Blackboard, so hold on a second. Oh, here we are. Um, actually, we're, we're going to another video. This is uh, um, this is one about advanced framing techniques. So um, let's watch that one as well. Hold on. Reisinger with Reisinger Homes. Welcome to my video blog dedicated to building science and fine craftsmanship. I want to talk about practical advanced framing on this video. But before we get to advanced framing, I want to show you what standard framing looks like. I'm in a 1950s house that my company is doing a deep energy retrofit. And this is all the original framing on the house. This is uh, two by fours that were framed in the 50s. You can see these two by fours are in 16 inch centers. And interestingly enough, this house had an addition uh, added about 10 years ago. And the framing on the addition, beside the lumber looking a little yellower, um, looks exactly the same. So let's walk back and I'll show you that. And then we're going to talk about a few of the things that we're going to do differently for advanced framing. So number one, this house, two by fours on 16 inch centers. Look at these uh, headers on here. These are the headers that were added about 10 years ago when these windows in this addition was framed. A ton of lumber in those headers. Lumber does have some R value, but it's quite minimal compared to the, uh, the foam that we've sprayed in those, in those cavities. And then lastly, I want you to notice uh, this three stud corner. This is a traditional three stud corner and uh, we've air sealed it. That's what this gray caulking is right here. But, uh, but really with a three stud corner like this, we have basically no insulation in that corner. Now my spray foam contractor has drilled these and tried to add some insulation there. And we've also done some rigid foam on this project to help with that. But I wanted to show you what standard framing looks like and some of the issues that you come across when you're, when you're framing fairly standardly. So now let's go out to a new construction project that my company is building. And we'll show you what practical advanced framing looks like. Advanced framing. If you've not heard of advanced framing before, the idea is that there's so much lumber in a house that actually most houses are probably overframed when it comes to the amount of two by fours, the amount of lumber or structure in the house. And so advanced framing is about reducing the nuts, the kind of the amount of lumber in the house in a smart way. So what I'd like to focus on today is kind of practical advanced framing. In this house, we took an approach that, that is not quite all the way, uh, but I think really makes sense for most people that are building a new house. I'm here in Austin, Texas. Uh, this is a cooling dominated climate. We do need some insulation in our walls, although not nearly as much as some other climates um, like the Northeast or in really cold climates. But I do prefer to frame all my houses with two by six exterior walls. And one of the first things we want to talk about when we're talking about advanced framing is the distance between the studs. These studs here, these two by sixes are in 24 inch centers. So it's 24 inches center to center in these studs. Most houses are framed 16 inch on center and that's unnecessary. 24 inches on center is plenty. A couple things about that that I do want to mention. I'm a big believer in a full exterior sheathing on the house. So you can see here we've used OSB um, on the outside of the house. I'd actually prefer to use plywood. So I did use uh, pressure treated plywood on the first two feet of my house. We're on slab on grade construction here. So this is a cement slab we're standing on. So at the lower part of the grade, pressure treated plywood in that area, which is a little more vulnerable. Then we should always be from there up. I'd prefer plywood, but um, we just didn't have it in this, in this particular project's budget. You can see how our floor joists up there, these are uh, two by four trusses that we've used for floor joists. Um, they've landed on a stud um, nicely. And then our headers, actually let's paint over here and show you one of the headers. 
Our headers are mainly uh, timber strand engineered headers. I'm a big fan of these. We do have a few LVL headers in some other places, but when we frame with a two by six exterior cavity, that header fits in basically a two by four space. And so it leaves us two inches um, from that outside face of the header until we hit our sheetrock. And if you look over here, we've started to insulate this header cavity. And that's one beauty of two by six framing is now I can use uh, insulated headers. So this is one layer of three quarter um, exterior rigid foam. We're going to add one more layer of three quarter and then a half inch plywood on top of that. And then everything will be nice and flush. And that will actually be an R10 header, which is fantastic. The second uh, very important point on uh, advanced framing, if you uh, scroll over to this corner, is how we do our corners. If you pan around here, you can actually see on the inside of this corner here. This is something that's uh, commonly referred to as a California corner or a two stud corner. You can see that our stud is way back here on this corner. And then we've added this stud, frankly, just as a uh, drywall backer. That could get eliminated in flavor of uh, drywall clips, but I'm just not sold in that process, so we put a stud in there. And then we're going to do a total fill installation on this cavity. I'm actually going to use Owens Corning Energy Complete. So this entire cavity is going to get R19 uh, packed full of a blown-in blanket. Really good insulation system. On the outside of the house, we're doing uh, three-quarter inch rigid foam. So that's uh, just a brief rundown on advanced framing. And again, the two most important things in my mind are going to 24-inch centers, doing these California corners. And then if you can switch to two-by-six construction, it makes a big difference. Uh, really like exterior sheathing. And last, when we install drywall, I really prefer to use five-eighths inch thick drywall instead of half-inch drywall. A lot of advantages to that. But the big one is when we go to advanced framing on 24-inch centers, it's a much stiffer product. We typically do smooth wall uh, in all our houses, so we have very smooth drywall. We're not using texture. And that 5 8 rock, uh, sheet rock, is much stiffer, gives a much straighter wall, and looks better in, in the finished product. And when we're going to 24-inch centers, I think that really makes sense to use that 5 8 sheet rock. It also ends up with a, a little bit of a quieter house because we've got a little bit more mass in our wall cavities. I think that's about it. Thanks for joining me, everybody. And if you're building or remodeling, please think about doing some, some practical advanced framing in your project. It makes a big difference. We're going to pack a lot more insulation in this house than if we would have done standard framing practices. And ultimately, there's, there's a benefit to both the builder and the client in saving uh, some of that additional lumber that wasn't really necessary. Talk to you soon. Why is it so hard for hardworking people to find a Okay. Um, any questions? Again, I like the uh, I like the the practical advanced framing because it's achieving a number of things simultaneously. Right, we're using less material and we're also having a more efficient, um, lower heat loss wall. So we're getting getting two benefits at once. Um, any questions on that material? Okay, again, I, I have those links posted if you want to go back and watch them again. Um, good question. Um,